Nice to meet you. My name is Barak, and I'm going to speak about extension land in my DEF CON talk, which is exploits and rootkits for your browser extensions. So let's get into it. Uh, first, a little bit about me. So my name is Barak Sternberg. I'm a senior security researcher, and I'm previously an author at Sentinel One Labs. I also did publish um, a, a research regarding smart devices and hacking smart devices in the last DEF CON. And I also have a BSc and MSc in algorithms, uh, specialized in bioinformatics. But today I'm going to really focus on my main appetite for vulnerability research and also um, to analyze malwares in the wild and combining it all uh, and focus on this presentation on the extension end. Uh, I also love to DJ and party, so check out also my Mixcloud for uh, mixes and such. So, concluding that, let's continue. So, what is the motivation for our talk? First of all, attackers are pushing harder and harder. There are more than two million extensions inside the web stores, inside the Chrome stores or the Mozilla store, and it's a widely popular target, both for developing malicious extensions and attacking these extensions with XSS, UXSS, etc. The second reason is that, well, extensions are cross-platform, of course, only for the desktop, but are cross-platform. They are generic in a sense. This just JavaScript a malicious thing to develop, and they have so many more permissions than just regular sites or even, you know, renderer exploit and stuff like that. They have permissions to access any region sometime, and they can control an entire browser among cookies and many other things as well. So the cross-path platform abilities and the easy uh, thing to develop make them a really popular target and also an interesting one to investigate and research. So the syllabus we have uh, contains a couple of, uh, couple of uh, subjects. First of all, I'm going to introduce you the Chrome extensions in general. I'm going to focus on the Chrome extensions in my Windows desktop, but it doesn't applicable only to these Chrome extensions in my desktop. It's applicable to any kind of uh, extensions which are desktop uh, uh, related. It's this kind of research and attack surfaces I observe uh, are also applicable to many other platforms as well. Next, I'm going to uh, tackle the uh, communication, uh, communication routines between the extensions beneath, besides, above, and in so many other places. After that, I'm going to go uh, into the Zotero extension. I'm going to tell you how I managed to jump from one good Chrome app, which seemingly doesn't do nothing in your computer, just, I don't know, open TCP sockets and kind of that's it. And from there to really own the browser by owning and pawning the Zotero extension, uh, managing to jump from one Chrome app to another. After that, I'm going to explode Vimium and reach UXSS in Vimium. Uh, because of some communication interesting problem and I will, be f I will finish with developing and implementing implanting my own extension rootkit and, and I tell you how to really modify any good extension that is previously, previously installed in your PC um, to make all of these, uh, all of these uh, extensions uh, go bad. So I'm excited, let's get started. So, first thing first, when I tackle the extension world, I tackle, of course, the extension autonomy, and I reach uh, to observe the multiple layers inside the extensions themselves. So, extensions actually include a couple of, uh, well, in a high-level manner, they include a couple of uh, uh, components. The first component, component is the content strip. The content strip is the, actually the extension's front end. It includes um, a specific type of, com of compound of, uh, uh, of JavaScript and HTML uh, uh, code that, is can be, that can be loaded in the matching sites. For example, if you're an ad blocker, so for every site, every site you are into, the content scripts are loaded. But compared to the background scripts, the content scripts are loaded only inside um, specific sites and they are not persistent. 
meaning they are not the same for, uh, for every site, and they disappear when you close the site. When you close the tab, these content strips are gone. The background is actually the back end of the extensions. There is like one dedicated process, which is really cool and is like behind it all, and it manages all the things related uh, to the extensions, main APIs, and it has many more APIs that is accessible, and also it can do uh, more, more things compared to the uh, front end content strip and it actually communicate, the background scripts and the content strip communicate between each other. Um, so if you know maybe Chrome, it's considered to be like the content strip is the renderer process which is in every site, and the background strip might be like the, 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 the godfather process which is like the browser context which is like uh, controls these tiny content strips in a sense. Cool. And least but not last, we have the extension there, which is in my PC in the local app data. And also one more important thing is the manifest. So if you maybe remember the manifest XML inside Android, it's actually exactly the same. The manifest XML uh, in the Android is quite similar in a sense uh, that is defining the whole approach about uh, how extension is built. And this is the manifest JSON, which is inside every extension. So the manifest JSON defines truly what will be the background scripts, what are the content scripts, what are the permissions the extension have, and so much more. The last thing is the signature. So every uh, extension also have its own signatures in a um, calculated directory. I mean calculated directory, I mean by that directory that includes all the hashes, SHA-1s, that are signed by the uh, public key of the extensions developer or the web store, dependent from where you have downloaded this, uh, this extension from. And the, the most important point to, to know about it is that every time you, uh, you open an extension or use an extension, this extension gets verified, and this extension gets verified and analyzed fully in a sense that if the data and the JavaScript inside these extensions are not valid and are not the same as published out there in the web and not signed, then the extension would be considered invalid and will not work. So Chrome automatically check the signatures for extensions dynamically. Cool. So let's go, go for the manifest autonomy. The autonomy of the extensions include these parts. As I, as I told you already, it defined in the first part um, in a cool JSON uh, kind of way. Uh, the first part is like a key values. The first part is like the background scripts. So it defined which are the background, whether it's persistent or not. Usually most of the background is persistent, meaning the process runs all the time of the background process. Content strip uh, with all their uh, definitions inside of them. And one of the most important things inside the content strip is actually the sites that are matched with. So, for example, if you go to Google, uh, you don't automatically load all the content strip for all the extensions. You just load the content strips that used to work on this site. So, if you have an extension that works only on Google, you can tell in the manifest, I'm working only on Google in the matches key. You can see the matches key inside the content strip and that will tell the browser to load this content strip only there. The last thing is that, well, the last important one is the web accessible resources, which are extension pages that are accessible. And I'll show you later on how uh, to uh, other websites and you can implement, embed them, uh, sorry, inside as an iframe in your website and also the permissions themselves, which mean the permissions that the, the extension can use. So concluding it all in some cool eye level uh, overview. So you can see the eye level diagram here and communication wise and the, the and eye level wise, you can see that DOM is, when you go, for example, to Google site, there is the DOM, which is the, uh, the main site, uh, the main context we have. This is like the, all the DOM HTML elements of Google, the page strips of, uh, of, the, of the Google sites and many more that are loaded are accessible, of course, to this DOM, but not just 
these page scripts, but also the content scripts and all the other sides uh, of the extension itself. So the extension is also accessible to the DOM, of course, if it should be loaded in this site, and the content strips can access the DOM page of these Google sites. The content strips, which are the font that I already told you, uh, use messaging platform to communicate to the background, to the back end of the extension itself. So the background page is the background context of the extension, and it doesn't directly communicate it with from the site, uh, only, well, mostly indirectly by the content strip itself. So this is like the whole communication between these things in the extension world. So a quick maybe reminder, maybe example for a couple of you, um, content scripts and background scripts. So if I'm an ad blocker and I want to remove all DOM elements that are advertisements, I can just access the DOM and remove these elements. So this is one example for the content scripts themselves. You can see this example over here. And the background scripts, if they want to remove specific ad or URL that is being processed and requested by the user and the browser's client, it can just remove it by using the web proxy. Well, actually the web request proxy. So it just adds specific hook to the web request and catch all the events, the network events, to redirect this URL to entirely new URL it, uh, it owns or just about blank if it wants to. Therefore, it blocks these advertisements in this, uh, in this manner. Uh, this is the technique of the background scripts. Okay, so let's consider now the website versus extension. Let's consider all the communication within that are available. So first of all, we have the cross-region messages. This one is really uh, a known way and a known technique to just make communication between uh, every arbitrary like origin, cross origin stuff, and they are widely popular and used also in extensions. You define your message listener, you do post message, and they communicate between each other. Uh, the second thing is the DOM changes in events, like uh, extension, the content strip can intercept and hook their own click events, on focus, they can search for specific div with specific classes and, and use them to do many things. And of course, if I'm an attacker website, I can control and define these kind of things. Uh, the last thing is the, well, is the most kind of unique and interesting property that extension have, and this is like extension pages that are accessible. They're like, in a sense, reminds of a content strip that are accessible to them, but they have more capabilities because you can embed specific web accessible URLs, which is URLs that the extensions need to define inside its manifest and they are open wide and you can embed them in an iframe in your own website and access them of course not SOP uh, breaking but you can access them in a manner that they can be embedded and they can be accessed for from cross region messaging or maybe many more features uh, that you can have so this is like the three main options I've been tackled in the uh, uh, website versus extensions content strip uh, communication routines. So how about, well, I talk about com content scripts. How about the background scripts? So the background scripts have cool way of communication in actually many other and non-suspectable ways. So first of all, there is the web request proxy. The exact web request proxy actually handles request and also the responses from the server side. So if we are maybe a malicious server wants to attack in a specific extension, we can maybe inject headers and or specific response that will be analyzed through this extension and therefore affect the extension background scripts. The background scripts intercept the request and the responses. This is a cool way to intercept and communicate in an indirect way with the background scripts. Another way for the background script is actually it can access the tabs, the cookies, uh, storage data, and much, much more inside, uh, inside the, the websites we have. So for example, the background scripts uh, have access to this API with the Chrome tabs, and it can query the, the info, the data, cookies, and much, much more. And we can affect them, of course, if we control specific sites. We can make a user 
access to these sites. And the last thing, which is not the web accessible pages, it's a new and a cool feature. Well, not so new, of course. It's a, it's a feature existing probably from 2012, but it's worth mentioning that you can externally connect also to pages. And by externally connect, doesn't I don't mean just uh, uh, embed an iframe of this extension page, but also like really uh, communicate with the background scripts through specific websites. So when you uh, open specific websites that the extensions defined as a valid one and an extension like trust on these sites, it can actually use the site um, to, uh, 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 to send messages to the background. So for example, in the following, uh, in the following uh, screen, you can see that uh, if I surf to the x.com site and x.com was previously defined as externally connectable, then the API interface to send message to this extension ID, which is handled in the background script, is open, is fully open to me to, ac to access. So it's a really cool way to access internals if I am, of course, accessible to these sites. Cool. So also extensions and extensions have communication between them. And it's, well, it can includes a couple of things. First of all, all the website versus extension communication is available, of course, because any extension usually can open a specific website or, uh, or fake maybe a new website and open a new tab and, and like uh, uh, fake this communication. Uh, so all what I showed you in the website communication is available. But also more things are available sometimes to extension. For example, the externally connectable sites uh, uh, can include also extension IDs that are able to uh, communicate with this extension. Of course, it's dependent on the extension developer to add your extension ID and to make sure that your is API is available to you as a remote extension. The other thing is also TCP and UDP connection. It dependent on permissions, whether you can open TCP server, TCP socket, and much, much more. And well, for example, let's say I'm, I want to do an injection from one extension to another extension. And the way I can do it is actually with these external connectable things. What I can actually do is to make the first extension to uh, inject the code into a legitimate site. So the second extension will actually think that this extension and this code that was injected in this site is actually is its own code. So we will think that this code is legitimate and the API, the Chrome, will open the API to send messages uh, uh, to, to this extension ID because my first extension was injecting JavaScript code to uh, a legitimate trusted site by the second extension. And therefore, we can manage to uh, communicate with the background scripts from one extension uh, to another, even though we might not have uh, the permission of uh, extension ID specific uh, API that is accessible. So we can inject to other site and communicate by that in the background scripts of the other one. Uh, it's really easy thing to do. Cool, so this is like uh, this kind of inject injection. Let's go now and dive into like, you know, we are all here for the vulnerabilities, right? So let's dive into the real business and show some vulnerabilities out there. So first of all, I've been tackled the Zotero extension. Uh, Zotero extension is a popular academic extension commonly used to organize citations and share research. It works really su and suits uh, completely with the Zotero desktop edition. And the Zotero desktop edition uh, save your data locally on the PC and it's plugging together usually uh, Zotero extension and the Zotero desktop. Not always. Many people actually use only the Zotero extension because it's easier to use, you don't need to configure anything, really easy. And they communicate the desktop version and the Zotero connector, they communicate for TCP ports uh, on localhost. So let's see what we can do with that. Or actually, well, you can understand by now that I'm going to exploit uh, this kind of thing and try to manage to run JavaScript code inside uh, Zotero extension. 
So I have also found that there is the Zotero translators. Zotero translators are cool features. Well, more than 500 uh, JavaScript translators that can get executed in every site you enter um, uh, but if within the Zotero extension. Uh, of course, they are really susceptible to su supply chain attacks. They are like open source and inside your git, uh, public GitHub in the Zotero repo. But I'm not going to consider and focus that. More we need to understand that this translator job is to actually uh, uh, take and extract specific data from specific websites and take, for example, URLs and, and academic URLs and citation notes and stuff like that and extract them using their own JavaScript um, to make, uh, to make uh, uh, citations and sharing much better. So I don't really know the fully, the whole way uh, about how this works, but I don't care. They help me to run code, they help me to run JavaScript code, so that's what, that's what I'm actually in for. And the way I managed to do it is actually by, well, you have the Zotero translation, also uh, an auto-update mechanism. This is like an auto-update system, and it actually tries to communicate with the standalone desktop edition I already told you about. And what it tries to do is to try to get new translators. If new translators need to be updated, it also downloads the new JavaScript code from there, and well, c'est la vie. So it's perfect to maybe try to manipulate and maybe try, I don't know, open and listen to specific port, listen to localhost maybe. Can we do these kind of things? Well, apparently yes. We can actually put new listener on the localhost. Uh, we can do it by, well, of course, my legitimate Mappy Chrome app. Uh, my Mappy Chrome app is a Chrome app and not a Chrome extension, but it's still a valid uh, uh, Chrome extension-like, it looks like a Chrome extension, it has some more capabilities. One of these capabilities is to uh, open TCP server on, well, on a high port, of course, but it's actually good enough for me. I just open a new port uh, on this, put a listener, and send a new JavaScript and execute code on uh, the content script inside the Zotero extension. So this all mechanism and the code is being run uh, after all, is actually being run in the content, strip, uh, content scripts uh, again, context. So the, uh, the content script actually try to run my code. You can see in this pre presentation that, like in these slides, you can see the eval. The eval consider like I'm in a sandbox manager kind of thing. I'm like, I'm doing a sandbox manager execution. Yeah, it should go right. Of course, it's a sandbox. Well, not so much sandbox. This sandbox manager actually, actually means nothing. And the code I'm able to execute in JavaScript mode here was able to access DOM elements, HTML elements, configurations, APIs, and it runs in the context, context of the Zotero. So we won, right? I'm like, I'm running my own JavaScript code inside the content strip. And I will show you later on a demo of how it's all done. So after I managed to run code inside the cont content strip itself, let's, well, let's be more greedy, right? Let's, uh, content strip, it's fine, but it's not persistent. We have a little bit of problems. Let's try to attack also the background strips, right? So from the content strip themselves, there are a lot of uh, APIs and attack surface I can use. So I try to investigate these attack surfaces. Of course, there is the send message and the connect one that like, uh, this is the interface between the content and the background script, as I already told you. And you have access to shared extension URLs. And there is also, there are also like a storage and configuration that might be shared. Uh, and all of these are quite interesting, but it's like an attack surface. And I don't really know how to continue from there, right? So I try to do the opposite and try to go, you know, easy peasy, let's go from the evils and, you know, the bad things that are doing in the background and try to trace back and found the attack surface that is reaching there and actually found something. So in the Zotero background suite, there is an interesting info related to the Google Docs integration. So let's see how it is done. So what I've observed is that in the background context of the Zotero mechanism, there is this weird Google Docs integration system. 
And by with Google Docs integration, I mean that they actually update the integration scripts for the Google Docs operation from remote website. And actually, this remote website can be easily configured using the Chrome storage uh, APIs. So on the first line here, you can see that the preferences are gotten from the, from the current uh, configuration. And then using these prefer preferences, the uh, Zotero mechanism for the Google uh, integration loads new background scripts for this integration itself. So as you can see on the next, on this slide, these scripts that have been remotely fetched from a new site, the JavaScript files, arbitrary JavaScript files, no validation, no verification, no signature even, only to validate that this version is higher than the current version and automatically download it, downloaded and executed in the background context. So you ask yourself, how can we control these ones, right? So we managed to control these ones because if we are in the content strips, we're actually accessible to the configuration of the background scripts, background scripts itself. So from configuration, we inject new configuration values inside the background scripts, hence fully control this remote server that, well, it's going to be downloaded in the background and executed the JavaScript code. And therefore, we launch arbitrary JavaScript code execution in the background. This gives us the ability to jump from the content script to the background script and run our arbitrary code, which is also persistent. And now let me show you a video of how it's actually done. Uh, you can see here, this is the Mappy extension, good extension, yeah, very good, absolutely. Um, you can see that it have permission only to TCP sockets and stuff like that, but no sites permission at all, um, no site permission at all. And I'm going to show you, uh, uh, it's going to be a little bit quicker. I'm going to skip uh, to the way that I managed to run code in the background script. And I will show you uh, how this data is being transmitted back to, uh, to my PC. So you can see this is the Zotero extension. This is property, it's accessible to all sites. I'm going to use the Zotero uh, extension in order to do privilege elevation uh, PE from my extension to another. You can see here, this is the background. Uh, while I was speaking, it was already doing uh, the injection from content script to the background script. And code was ran in the background script and send it back to my, uh, to my server. Uh, here you can see I'm searching for something. It will also appear in my site because I injected from the Mappy into the background script uh, on the Zotero. You can see that there's nothing shown in the network in, in the DevTools. I'm not sending anything from this VM context. It's totally hidden. So I'm actually tracing the user from another different context inside the Zotero context. And you can see that all the data is being received back to me and I'm fully control of this browser by exfiltrating data back to my PC. And my code is actually running inside this good, beautiful extension, the Zotero extension. And I jump from one extension to another. The map extension is actually not relevant now. You can remove it, but it won't change anything because I already injected my configuration uh, inside this Zotero extension. That's it. So I'm actually fully controlled. Nothing in the dev tools, nothing in the network you can see. It all happens in separate VM context and uh, execution. Okay, let's go to now to another extension. Let's go to the Vimium extension. So the Vimium extension make your browser a Vim-like extension. It helps you to, uh, to easily do browser navigation without mouse clicks and anything like that. Um, it has its own keyboard shortcuts. Uh, like, uh, like in Vim, you know, you can do copy, edit, search, navigate, and much, much more. And this is, for example, an example of how we do it. Uh, you can see that when you click a couple of buttons in the keyboard, all of the links in the browser seems like a clickable links by the keyboard. And for example, when you click D, you will actually go to the search bar and you can easily navigate just with your keyboard inside all of these, uh, all of these uh, 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 browser uh, viewable objects. So this is a cool thing, but 
let's say, well, our scenario is we are a website, not an extension. We can consider extension, but it might be a little bit harder thing to do. So let's uh, consider now only a website, and we want to attack Vimium extension, like Vimium extension users. Um, so let's see what is our attack surface. So our attack surface is actually includes all the things I've been talking to you about in the communication routines and stuff, but it includes much, much more. For example, it includes the Vonimdebar widget, which is a widget that seems like a search bar with, where you can easily search inside the Vimium extension for more data and stuff. The helper widget, which open an help thing and visual mode, like a Vim kind of thing. So it has a lot of uh, possibilities to do. And I focused on, actually, on the uh, Vomnibar iframe. The Vomnibar iframe was seemingly the most interesting uh, widget I've been found out. So how the Vomnibar iframe works is actually quite interesting. So the user clicks enter, O and enter, and then the content strips uh, catch this event, the, the on-click event, the enter event, and adds an iframe. It adds the Vomnibar iframe. And when this Vomnibar iframe is being added, it's not enough. It's, this iframe is actually a widget, a page from the extension that is accessibly, accessibly uh, website uh, URLs defined from the manifest of the Vimeo. And after you put that, you still want the content strip and this iframe to communicate between each other. And this is exactly what they are going to do. On the next step, they are going to authorize. So the content strip try to authorize with its own secret to uh, the Vomnibar iframe. The Vomnibar iframe, because it runs under the page extension, is also accessible to this current secret, the Vimium secret. So it can verify that the one, the, the, the one context, the browser that is going to uh, uh, access him and try to communicate with him uh, have the relevant secret. So it verifies also this uh, secret. And after it verifies the secret, it opens also a message channel, which is kind of a JavaScript kind of mechanism to place like a TCP kind of uh, uh, sockets between uh, uh, different website contexts. So now the content strip and the Vimium, Vomnibar communicate between each other, all cool, all good. Uh, they know that if I am an attacker, I can actually put the Vonibar iframe in my site and maybe try to authorize myself, right? Um, but I still need, yes, you're right, I still need to break this Vimium secret. So how does the Vimium secret is being generated? How does the token we've talked that used for authorization is being generated? Well, apparently it's a very, very state-of-the-art random number generation. As you can see here, they just used math.random. And math.random is actually pretty predictable mm, if you are in the same process, of course. Unfortunately, we are not in the same process. So does it mean we can't break it? Not quite. Because the secret is contained, well, only 31 bits of entropy, then we can manage to use that and actually do brute force and maintain this brute force to succeed um, in, in our operation of breaking this secret. This is like an example of a brute force. Uh, we inject our own vulnerable iframe. We place a new element, a new iframe element. We then uh, set this iframe element to, to point to the vulnerable uh, HTML I showed you. And then we try to authenticate with this, uh, to authorize us between the uh, this iframe, we use the secret that we want to boot for. So for example, in this code, it's the de dead beef. So I try to guess that the secret is dead beef, and I'm sending data to this content window. If I get success, the port is open. If not, no response, and nothing, nothing goes, uh, goes on. So this is like uh, this is like a cool opportunity to do brute force, but we have a couple, couple of problems I've been tackled uh, with it. First of all, this, uh, uh, this is not scalable because if the browser is hidden, the tab is hidden, you go to another website, you close the screen, then the JavaScript gets suspended because it runs on the front end. So what I managed to do is actually, well, why not web workers? Web workers is a, well, amazing opportunity to just do whatever you want because they are suitable to run in the background. 
So when I use the web workers, I trigger the brute force routines from the background of the web workers themselves. So I use the background web workers to actually in periodically, interval, uh, trigger the brute force routine which are lays inside the context I, uh, I open, inside the iframe. So the flow was like web worker triggers at every two milliseconds uh, the fronted routine that do the brute force attempt and going on and on and on stays up even when uh, and it also stays up even if the tab or the window is hidden it stays up at all time it's it's such an awesome thing so it's like even if the screen is closed even if I'm an advertisement I can like place my own things and you won't even notice it and I can run it days and days until you close your browser so it's really really cool thing I used web walkers and now we've broken the Vomnibar uh, secret. So uh, let's now focus on the Vomnibar communication. Uh, the Vomnibar communication uh, well includes well a couple of things they can do. So we I assume now we broke the secret, the Vimium secret, and I'm trying to communicate between this iframe, this real iframe, and try to manipulate them. Uh, first operation is it search for URL completion. The second thing, it activates search um, and jumps to new URLs. Uh, it also helps you search for ints. It does auto completion for, for things and stuff. Yeah, I don't really care about these things, right? And the last thing it used to run JavaScript code, this, this is the main course, right? Cool, so how it works. So for example, Let's say I have this Vomnibar, Vimium, which seems like this search bar. This is, from, this is the Vimium widget. And I write inside JavaScript scheme. And then I click Enter. And voila. So I actually can also inject JavaScript using like JavaScript scheme is inside this Vomnibar browser text. It's, it's really cool. But the main problem with that is that I run code inside this website's context. So I can't really get out of my context, right? I stay in my context in this example.com that triggers originally this iframe, this vulnerable iframe. And it come to rescue some communication problem. Yes, well, I managed to run JavaScript, cool. This gets into the picture the um, communication problem. So how the Vomnibar and the JavaScript scheme. So we're trying to find auto-completion. It calls some background script. So the Vomnibar iframe called the content script, the content script called the background script. The background script returns with a send message to the current tab, uh, the result. So it returns data to the content script running currently uh, in this tab. This is how we do it. And the, send, the last send message is from the background to to the context, and it says to him, okay, execute JavaScript. Okay, but what happens actually if we place one more iframe in this, in this area? So because Vimium is actually run inside all of the iframe inside current tab, and the content scripts are inside every tab inside these uh, inside this, uh, iframes, so if the background context do send message to the content strip inside specific tab, it actually send message to all of the content strip inside this tab. And if it does send message, for example, um, evaluate and execute JavaScript in this content strip, so it actually means we can manage to run JavaScript code inside another website. And this is the whole thing. The reason is that there is no validation you get a send message. You get a message from the background script, and the content script doesn't really know which one was actually the trigger. Uh, well, in our scenario, of course, you can add uh, defenses for that. But in our scenario, you don't know, and you usually don't know which one was actually triggering this uh, send message. Okay, so the reason that it works is that uh, when you place handler in the content script. Um, uh, the own the own message, which is the handler for send messages from the background, runs inside every content strip, content script inside this tab. So every content strip inside this tab 
will run uh, uh, its own message ender. So that way we can manipulate other content strips and inject to them our own data uh, and evaluate inside them our should be messages. So let's see now uh, how it works uh, in, uh, in the content strip and the background uh, script context. And I'll show you the communication between them and show what is problematic. And later on, I will also show you the demo that concludes it all. So first thing first, the content strip actually sends a message to a from a specific iframe to the background script. After it does that, then the point background script sends a message back to this tab. So it sends a message to this tab with the send message API. And when it happens, uh, the content strips inside, well, you can see that I have here two iframes, in, in, like one iframe and one top frame. So you need to consider that I have in one iframe, which is abc.com, and the top frame, which is the example.com. And when the background send the message, both of them receive the message. The content strip that runs inside this iframe runs as well. And also the content strip that uh, is in example.com also receive this message. So this is the problem. We can trigger the JavaScript scheme uh, handling message. And then when the response gets back from the background, it will be sent to all iframe and execute our JavaScript in another context. That's really cool. So let's now see a demo of it. So now you can see, this is my uh, Chrome version. And you can see, well, this was the later, latest one before I update. Uh, I did a pull request and I updated the, the, uh, and fixed this bug. So you can see this is the site. And whenever the user will click on Enter, it will inject the code in facebook.com. You can see that the site is localhost. So whenever the user click enter, JavaScript will be executed not on the attacker side, not on the localhost side, but on the facebook.com, which of course you can see is invisible over here. So, and this happens exactly because the communication problem I told you about uh, before. Cool. So to conclude it all, um, We'll show you now a technique that will be able uh, to any attacker to modify previously good extension in your machine and also make them persistent uh, with some generic techniques uh, which are available to any Chrome version. And it's a really cool thing because in that way you can also add permissions, change extension and modify it. And why it's not an easy peasy thing to do is, well, the reason is that uh, the extension directory is, is signed. So Chrome, Chrome uh, uh, software actually verifies and analyze this extension directory and verifies that all the signature in the ashes for this extension data is the same as, as it should be. So you can't really change in runtime, even not in, in afterwards, um, and, and make this extension be a different one. But you can still think about the, uh, the scenario where, well, I'm a developer. I really am a devoted developer, and I don't want to sign my extension every time I do bug fix. I want to check things. I want to add features. I don't want to sign my extension every time. So of course, there is a method to load new extension as developer, right? So yes, you're right. There is like an unpacked mode that helps developers load their extensions without verifying the signatures and without verifying anything uh, regarding the extensions for compatibility and to, checks, uh, to check their, uh, their extensions. So the scenario here is that you manage to run code of a user uh, device. There is a post-exploitation uh, method like, and we pr I propose like a, pr a post-exploitation technique which uh, consider uh, installing new persistent JavaScript put it inside your machine. And the way we can actually do it is actually exploit this unpacked mode to replace previous extension. The extension will look almost the same. The user won't even notice because its previous extension will work as suggested. All the, I don't know, antivirus and stuff will, will see that, well, the extension ID will stay the same, all will be the same, so all cool, no problem. The way we can do it is actually by adding a new argument 
this new whole argument called load extension, we add it to the argument in the command line, and this argument gets the path of the extension to open up. And when this extension is actually the same as the previous extension, it just replace it without check the signature, without checking nothing, and without even warning the user. This is really cool, and it's an amazing technique to just, you can modify specific files, add this argument, and then you can replace every extension you want. And when you modify good extension, you can actually also add any permissions you need. Uh, you can also add uh, file system access with the file URLs. Um, you can add so many features that run in the Chrome context. Um, you can also access to cookies, tabs, and much, much more, as I already told you. And you can also run Edenly in a separate Eden context. So now I show you how Eden we are in this context and how it looks like to replace and use a persistent generic technique to replace um, a specific uh, extension. In this uh, video, I present you the replacing of the ad blocker. You can see that ad blocker is installed in your machine. It installed, like Google tell, tells you, it installed correctly, no problems. The ID is correct, all, the ID is correct, it all installed correctly. You can see that even if you go to the extension uh, 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 privacy, uh, the extension privacy uh, area, you can see it all looks the same, but you can see here that I injected my own JavaScript prod, and this is the main thing. I injected and modified this persistent extension in your PC, but I kept all its data and all the things inside of it uh, almost the same, and it looks the same, the extension ID the same, Chrome things is installing legitimate extension, and it's really cool technique um, to inject malwares inside extensions. So finally, I will introduce you the, my utility, which is the maltensions. This is like a utility to help you generate uh, for testing, of course, of course, for testing. Uh, JavaScript malwares uh, inside uh, popular extensions and, and actually any extension. Um, this is the GitHub source and it has a lot of techniques. I placed like many techniques you can do plug and play inside of them. Easy to comply your own JavaScript in output, output of standalone JavaScript you can inject as a payload or as an extension you can open up in an, an unpacked mode, whatever you need and it has so many features. So, to conclude, first, extension can be used for PEs. PEs like in the extension world. Using one extension to gain more permissions from another permissionless extension. The second thing is that detections will get harder because it's very hard to, to find out like dynamic executions and JavaScript evaluation inside new extensions and they can do whatever they want inside of them. The third thing is that, well, there are more attack surfaces to explore. Attack surfaces are not considered only the typical ones, but more like content scripts to background scripts attack surface, uh, background scripts to websites, extension to extension attack surfaces. Many of them haven't yet explored so far, not in this manner before. Well, and unfortunately it means that, well, extensions and malicious extensions are probably here to stay. And this is the bullet we need to carry on with us. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to talk about this uh, presentation. Uh, I hope you learned and made the best out of it.